about doing. Uh, Nathaniel was a little skeptical. He kind of, if you'll remember that message, this was now going back about four weeks. This is our fourth sermon, but we took a week off last week. And uh, the, the Nathaniel, the skeptic, he kind of had that RCA dog look, right? Jesus, what? The Messiah? Are you kidding me? And then we've also talked about the outcast and the insider. We talked about them on the same way. The outcast was the woman at the well and uh, the Samaritan woman. And then the insider was Nicodemus. And we said this, we said, if these two have anything in common, then we all have something in common because she was as outcast as they could come and he was the ultimate religious insider. He was a member of the Sanhedrin. He was, he was the very elect of the church. And, and Jesus, of course, just talked to her about maybe tweaking her life a little bit and he wanted to give her water that would make her to never thirst again, which she was being all realistic, right? H2O. And he was talking about the water of life. And, and then he goes in and, and the next chapter or actually in the previous chapter, I think it was uh, Nicodemus shows up. And Nicodemus, who no doubt has his act together, probably just needs a little tweak. I mean, if the woman at the well needed a little tweak, he needs a little tweak. And Jesus says to him, you must be born again. Just start over, man. You're so sure that you're right. You're so sure your religion is spot on. Just start over again and let's start from the beginning. And uh, boy, it's very interesting that the same answer for both of them was Jesus Christ. And uh, make sure you know, by the way, spoiler alert, the, the, the big answer to all these big questions is Jesus Christ, okay? And then let's see, what did we do last week? Last week we talked about Mary and Martha, the grieving sisters. And uh, talked about how Jesus, or that's two weeks ago, I should say. Jesus came to them and met them, and they both had the same verbiage, but a totally different position of their heart, if you were with us and saw that. Now, if you weren't with us for this sermon series, you can always catch up on our app. Uh, just go download the Nebo Crossing app from the, sto- uh, the app store on your phone or device, and you can go back and listen to the sermons and catch up. Um, you're just not allowed to miss church and do that. I know, summer's coming. Some of you are like, you know, my app works out there on the boat. You know, just saying. We could. Uh, I'm kidding. If you need to do that, you do it, and we'll have fun. And just invite your preacher every once in a while is all I'm asking. <clears throat> Here's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about an ancient wedding feast. Now, I want to make sure you understand. Everybody knows where I'm going with this. Jesus' first miracle or sign, and I'll explain that to you here in just a second. But we're going to take a look at this amazing wedding feast. Boy, I tell you, there's a lot here. First of all, you just forget every wedding you've ever been to, okay? Do not go to the weddings you've been to for a point of reference. We live in a Western culture. We live in an individualistic society. The wedding is about who? The bride. It's her day. And, uh, and I, I can't wait to get to the part of the message where I get to tell you about what Kristen told me this week. And so I, I'm just pumped to get there. Finally, someone else is going to be hated in this room besides me. And it's going to be Kristen Waddle. And I'm pumped about that. I can't wait to get there. It's coming soon to a pulpit near you. I can't wait. And, uh, uh, but I, I, I had to ask some questions because I don't think like a woman. And Kristen shared how women think. So don't you get mad at me. I'm going to tell you how women think according to Kristen. And so uh, she's right. Wave at us, Kristen, back there. Good. That's good. I'm excited about this. And so we're going to talk about this ancient wedding feast. Now, listen, back in this day, the wedding was a community event. It was huge. The reason it was big is because community and overall family was more important than the individual. You had to understand what was going on in this day. There'd be this little village somewhere, and the only hope that village of, had of becoming anything more than just a place where some poor people lived was family and community. I mean, they, they weren't popping up casinos back in this day. The tourism industry was nothing. There was no money for tourism, okay? This was, this was big families, many kids. The more children you had, the more chance you had of having someone smart enough to maybe figure out some medical issues, the more chance you had somebody strong enough to maybe plow a couple more years after dad can't run the plow anymore. Uh, you, more family members you had, you find somebody could crack that coat on biscuits and make some good ones, you know? And uh, it was just all about figuring out how to have bigger community families. So the weddings were a big moment. The wedding was coming of age for the, the, the children. The, the husband and the wife. And, and if you knew the ages they were getting married, you would definitely call them children. It was very young weddings, 14, 15. I dare say some of the 14, 15 year olds back then were more mature and more productive citizens in the community than some of our 25 and 30 year olds today. But uh, I digress. But it was a very different day. So what the wedding feast was, was uh, we just sang about the art of celebration. Humanly speaking, a wedding was the art of celebration for the whole community. It would rival the Livermush Festival. 
how you doing? If you're not from around here, you're wondering, don't worry, it's a big deal. And uh, it was a big thing. And so what would happen is the community would come in. Yes, it was the big day for the bride and the groom, but honestly, the whole community looked at it as this is a big day for all of us because there's another family. They're gonna start cranking out babies and we're gonna have better economics and better military strength. And, and our, our city is coming uh, to fruition right before our eyes. This is a, a wonderful day. So a, a wedding feast was a festival atmosphere. It was festival joy. It was the whole city was excited. And it was a major, major deal. And, and so there was a responsibility placed upon the family of the bride and the bridegroom to make sure that the party happened for five to seven days. I mean, it was just, a, everybody just had a time. And that's the situation we find this story in with Jesus. Let me read you the scripture. John chapter two, verse two is where we're gonna read from. It'll be here on the screen if you wanna follow along. John chapter two, verse two. And both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. So here's this wedding feast and they called Jesus in the south and said, party on, it's happening. And uh, they, so they went in verse three, uh, let's see, lead me, there we go. And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus saith unto him, they have no wine. Now listen, this wasn't, uh, that word wanted, is it, this is in the King James Version, so it's an old English. They didn't just want some, they wanted for it. They had run out, they were in want. It was gone, and that's not supposed to happen on like day one or two. Day five, six, seven, okay, you know, we had a good time. Day two, what you talking about, Willis? This, this party's supposed to be going on for some days. This is a major issue. This is, and, and by the way, in a guilt and shame culture, this was a really bad way to start a marriage in a community. This was shame. This is kind of a, uh, you can almost hear a great uncle going, a pox on them and their house. What are you doing running out of wine on the second day? This was a major, major deal. And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus, Mary, saith unto him, they have no wine. This is a big deal. To us, it's like, so what? Pass the punch. No, this is huge. This is, this is a big deal. Jesus saith unto her, woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. We'll come back to that. What a response from Jesus. Almost sounds a little like disrespectful, doesn't it? You imagine your son saying, woman, what have I to do with thee? <laughs> you know, uh, just hang with me. We'll come back and explain what's going on there, all right? Um, his mother saith unto the servants, whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. And there were set there six water pots of stone after the manner of the purifying of the Jews containing two or three firkins apiece. These are big pots, uh, 30 to 50 gallons. Jesus saith unto them, fill the water pots with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he saith unto them, draw out now and bear unto the governor of the feast. And they bear it. When the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine and knew not whence it was, but the servants which drew the water knew, the governor of, feast, of the feast called the bridegroom. He calls the groom over. He says, uh, saith unto him, every man at the beginning does set forth good wine. And when men have well drunk, then that which is worse. But thou hast kept the good wine until now. Verse 11, this is an important verse. I want you to see this. This beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee and manifested forth his glory and his disciples believed on him. Now, now, keep this up here for just a second if you don't mind. This is a very, very key verse. If you go look at it in the original language, this word miracle can be interpreted two different ways. Miracle, but also a sign. I like that interpretation of it, a sign. Some of your Bible says sign in it, and some of your Bible says miracle in it. Both are correct. The reason I like the word sign is it's not just a miracle. It is a sign. It is a picture, it is, a, it is important. And it says this, this beginning of signs or miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee and manifested forth his glory. This is about the glory of Jesus. It is, a, it is a sign of his glory. Now that's important for us to understand, for us to go back and kind of understand what is the big question in life that this little story here is gonna answer. By the way, there's a, there's a man that made a great case for the authenticity of the Bible. He wrote a book called The Three Gospels. And uh, it was a gospel of John and the gospel of Mark. And then he wrote as a literary uh, uh, genius, a, a third gospel deduction of the gospels. And of course, that would not really be a gospel. It was just his, his literary work. But here's one of the cases that he made. The case that he made was this, 
that the account of John here has to be written by an eyewitness and not a fictional story because no one would write a fictional story and make this the first miracle. Nobody was dying. Nobody was filled with a demon. Nobody had leprosy. Nobody was blind. Nobody was sick. Jesus, who came to do all of those things, have you ever wondered why he did this? Now, most of us should go, well, because Mary messed him all up and messed up his plan. He's like, woman, what am I going to do with they? And it's Mary. No, that's not why. This is, this is a wonderful, wonderful sign of the glory that is supposed to be brought to the Son of God and manifested forth his glory, who? Jesus. And the disciples believed on him. So here's what Jesus did. He's at this community function and there's this faux pas, there's this gaff, there's this goof up, there's this mistake. They've run out of wine. And Mary, his mother, comes to him and says, they've run out of wine. Enough said. I mean, she didn't have to explain what was going on. This was a problem. And Jesus says to her something very interesting. He said, woman, what am I to do to thee? And then he says, my hour has not yet come. Now, we'll talk about that here in just a second. What Jesus brings to this situation and to our situation is this. This is the first point I want to make to you. What he brings. We're going to talk about what he brings, why he brings, and how he brings. Okay, so we'll just kind of go through this. Here's what he brings. He brings, we, we're introduced to a character we don't know much about, but he's the governor of the feast. He's the one in charge of the festivities. Probably the youth pastor at the church, right? Everybody wants to have a good party, makes the youth pastor the governor of the feast. So, no, I'm kidding, that, that's probably not right. But, uh, but he's the guy that knows how to have a good time. He's the guy that knows how to tell the joke when you need a joke and the tear-jerking story when you need a tear-jerking story. He knows how to get it kicked off again at 8 a.m. the next morning when everybody's still enjoying the wine from last night. I mean, this guy knows how to have a party for five days, maybe a DJ at a radio station. I don't know who he was, but uh, he knew how to have a good time. And the governor of the feast we're interested to, and he, uh, it, it, we're introduced to and here's what Jesus says here's what he's saying actually I am the true master of the banquet and actually I am the Lord of the feast and I am going to bring festival joy now remember the ministry of Jesus Christ was to correct perspective on the planet all of us had a perspective this was the art of celebration and Jesus is almost saying you ain't seen nothing yet I am telling you that I am the governor of the feast. I am the true festival joy giver. I am going to bring you joy like you've never had before. Psalm chapter 34, verse 8. Uh, the psalmist says this, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. Here's what the psalmist is saying. The psalmist is saying, you might know Jesus, but I want you to taste Jesus. Now, that sounds really weird. It sounds very strange, but here's what the psalmist is saying. I want you to know deep down inside of you the joy that Jesus brings. I don't want you to just know about it like with a temporal head knowledge. I want you to know it like deep in the fiber of your being. And in the Bible days, when you tasted something and consumed something, it went down inside of you. That's what they were saying when they said taste it. And oh, taste and see the Lord is good. It sounds funny in our culture, but in their culture, it was like, no, do you know deep down inside it cures what ails you? The pain, the void, the, the, the frustration, the fear, the guilt, the shame that you and I both carry, taste Jesus because when he comes into contact with that guilt and that shame, he fixes the gaffes. He fixes the mistakes. <laughs> you know the Lord is good, but taste it. I love this uh, scene from the Lord of the Rings. By the way, just in the interest of full disclosure, I've never made it through a whole Lord of the Rings movie. There's something about that cinematic music Anybody else struggle with this one? How many of you love the Lord of the Rings and have made it through all of them? How many of you, like me, have started and fallen asleep every time? I told you, honey. It's normal. She's so mad at me about this. I, but anyway, during the Lord of the Rings, there's this one scene where, I think I've seen this one. <laughs> uh, Sam, <laughs> Samwise Gangi, he comes and he says to Gandalf, is that how you say his name? Gangi. Uh, see, sometimes I just throw in nerd exposures and you just exposed yourself, all of you. Nerd, 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 nerd. Okay. Um, Samwise Gamgee said this, Gandalf, I thought you were dead, but then I thought I was dead. Is everything sad going to come untrue? 
And if you understand that, here's what he's saying. Exactly what Jesus said. Jesus wants you to know this. Everything you know that's sad is going to come untrue. In me. I am the festival joy giver. And the first miracle I'm going to do... Listen, preachers say it all the time. I've probably said it. Jesus came to die. Mm, not really. Oh, oh, I know what you mean, preacher. Jesus came to live again. Not really. Ultimately, Jesus came to restore the festival joy and community that he intended in the Garden of Eden. That we messed up in our sin. We're getting down to one of the big questions of life, and that is this, what is life all about? Well, it's supposed to be about festival joy in community with a God that loves this planet and the people of it. But our sin broke that and destroyed that. And you might be like Samwise here that's going, my goodness, I thought you were dead, but then again, I thought I was dead. Is everything sad gonna come untrue? And the answer is a resounding yes. You who are dead in your trespasses and sin have a savior that you might have thought died on a cross, but he rose again so that you can rise again and everything sad is going to come untrue. This is the great story of the Bible. Jesus Christ is quite literally saying this, I am the Lord of the feast. In the end, I come to bring joy. That's why my first miracle is to set everyone laughing. He, his first miracle is a sign of the ultimate journey. Yes, it's going to go by way of the cross. Yes, it's going to go by way of the keys to death, hell, and the grave. But it's all for an end purpose, which was the original purpose, that God have festival joy with his people. One day we're going to get to heaven, and there's something called the marriage supper of the Lamb. How many of you are already a little bit excited? How many of you, at good Baptists, their mouths water a little bit when you say marriage. It's, as much as we love Jesus, we're thinking about what a heavenly biscuit must taste like. Because I'm telling you, some of y'all have gotten close. But it's not a heavenly biscuit yet. And uh, Hardy's does pretty good, honestly. But uh, uh, I'm talking about a heavenly biscuit. I'm talking about, man, can you imagine? Uh, let me just help the Baptists in the room. There might, might be a few out there. Can you imagine heavenly fried chicken? I'm talking about, you got your free range. What about chickens have been free for all of eternity? <laughs> Son, that's going to be good. There's no biblical content to this. If you're taking notes right now, you're missing everything. But uh, it's just fun to think about. Now, here's the question. Why? Why does Jesus need to restore festival joy? Well, the big why is because of our sin. I'm not here to beat you up this morning, but I am here to say all of us have something inside of us that takes the joy away. It's the joy stealer. It's the hope quencher. It's the happy destroyer. And we have it inside of us. It's called our sin nature. And here's the great lie of the wicked one. You think your sin is where it's at, but the end thereof are the ways of death, the Bible says. Jesus says, look, Satan's big ploy in the garden of that fruit, that forbidden fruit was gonna make you wise. It was gonna make you know as much as God. And the second she touched it and ate thereof, and Adam too, they began to die. It was the great deceiver doing his greatest act of deception. He was destroying festival joy. And we can study the Garden of Eden and see that the joy that Adam and Eve knew every morning walking with God ceased and desisted in that second. And death passed upon creation. So Jesus, the why is that, Je the, that we have sin in our lives. But the how is very interesting. The how is Jesus looks over and he sees these ceremonial jars. Now let me explain what these ceremonial jars were for. Because remember, this isn't just a miracle. This is a sign. Which means everything is important in it. These ceremonial washing jars that had so much water in them was because when people came in to the feast, they were dirty and there's this was a ceremonial washing it wasn't really to make them clean but it was a picture that one day the messiah is going to come 
and he is going to restore us and wash us and make us clean again. So ceremonially, uh, May the 20th, we're going to have a baptism. We'll have a baptistry set up on one side. Uh, they switch it every time. I don't know. There'll be a baptistry somewhere around here. And uh, we will, during that baptismal service, it will be a ceremony. It's a baptism ceremony. It is a sign, it is a picture of someone that is lost, putting their faith and trust in Christ and being baptized in his blood and they come up ceremonially clean. It is a picture of what really happened when they put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. This is a sort of sign. Jesus looks over and sees these ceremonial wash pots and he says, I tell you what, fill those up with water. And I'm sure that the servants were like, oh yes sir, we know what he's doing. We're gonna have a ceremony. He's going to wash and he's gonna do, he's the rabbi teacher. He's going to teach something here that has to do with the ceremonies of the day. And I can see them as they get these things filled up and they bring them back in and they set them before him. And after all, Mary said, whatever he tells you to do, do it. He said, draw some out and take it. And I can almost see Jesus handing them a wine glass and saying, take it to the governor of the feast. And this guy's going, this is for washing your feet. This is for washing your hands. This is not for consumption. This isn't for, this is, this is for a picture. This is, a, we are dirty and one day the Messiah is gonna come and make us clean again. And Jesus says, trust me, yes, I've come to do that, but I've come to set you laughing. I've come to bring back festival joy. The means to the end, yes, but the end, festival joy with the Father. As they take it to the governor of the feast, you know the story, we just uh, read it. Jesus is saying he has come into the world to accomplish in reality what the ceremony and sacrificial laws of the Old Testament only pointed to. This is a huge miracle and sign. Why? Why did Jesus do this? Let me give you the second thing. Why? Well, we are, as I said, sinners. We're stained. We are in need of purification. We need to be clean. We have guilt, we have shame, and we need to be rescued from it. And that's what Jesus is doing here. Jesus is coming into this moment, and this is why the conversation with Mary starts to make more sense. Mary comes to Jesus and says, they have no wine. And Jesus, his, his mind, and by the way, if you've been in this study with us, you'll find out that he's always tracking on a level mentally that the people in the story aren't tracking with. Am I right? We miss him, right? Like the woman at the well was like, oh, water, H2O? I'll never have to come draw again? Great. And Jesus is like, no, I'm talking about spiritual water. I'm gonna save your soul. You'll never thirst again. That void inside of you is gonna be filled with me. Nicodemus, right? Nicodemus says, Jesus says, Nicodemus, you must be born again. He's thinking, can I go back into my mother's womb? And Jesus is like, no, I'm talking about spiritual birth. So they're always kind of missing each other. And in this story, we find out that Jesus' mind is on a level that, that would explain his response to Mary. And I think we can get there through study. So let's take a look at it. We see here that Jesus is doing this to deal with something that is wrong with us. There was something wrong at this wedding feast. It was a gaffe, it, it was a social sin, it was a, a party foul to run out of wine on the second day. And Jesus says, I've come to take care of this. Now, some of you are sitting here, <coughs> don't raise your hand on this, but you're thinking, I don't have any gaffes. I don't really have any, I'm doing really good. Uh, you can raise your hand on this one. Like myself, is anyone in here a pretty big fan of yourself? Oh, y'all are all churchy this morning, aren't you? You act a yeah, you got your church on. You're just gonna act like I'm the only guy in here being real. How many of you are pretty big fans of yourself? If a hammer's coming towards your finger, how many of you move? It's because you like you, okay? You know what I'm saying? You like you a lot, okay? So here's, here's what's going on here. You know that there's something inside of you. Anybody seen the first Rocky film? You remember this, this moment? Sylvester Stallone's standing in the, the ring prior, the night before the fight, got a big poster of Apollo Creed behind him and big poster of himself and he looks over at the, the promoter of the fight and he's like the sign's all wrong I, mean, I can't do his voice but <laughs> something like that and uh, the sign's all wrong I, I'm, I'm wearing uh, I think it was white shorts with a red stripe and the sign had red shorts with a white stripe and the promoter looks at him and says it doesn't really matter does it mm. see he was never supposed to win he's 
out of his league and the scene goes on and he shows him walking and he's in there by himself and he realizes basically he doesn't have a shot and he walks home and he gets to the house and he flops into bed next to Adrian and he, he falls into bed next to her and he's having a bad moment and she's like what's wrong and he's like man you know what I can't do it there's no way I could beat with beat him and he goes on to say all I want to do is go the distance I just want to go the distance so everybody at home knows I'm not a bum there's some inside of Rocky And there's something inside of all of us that says, you're a bum. This is why you work so hard. This is why you get up in the morning and this is why you started another business when you probably should have been winding it down. Can I get a witness for the senior adults in the room that haven't figured it out yet? This is is why you, you, you keep going. I'm not being ugly this morning. I'm saying, I get it. You get it. Honey, all God's children get it. There's something inside of us that says, achieve more, achieve more. Overcompensate the fact you're a bum. Some 90% of injuries on the basketball court of people over 40 is because they're still trying to prove they're not a bum. I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to die, you know, but I also, I want to live. And I, I, living is beating my kid. And then it doesn't work. Why are you working so hard? Why do you need to be right all of the time? No nudges, no nudges. The reason you need to be right all the time, the reason you need to work so hard is because there's some nagging voice inside of you that says, you're a bum, you're a bum. Why do you worry so much about how you look? Why is it so important to you who friends you on Facebook and who who gives you thumbs up or thumbs down? And, And why is it so bad that when you trip and fall, you pop up so fast, you injure yourself on the return? Because you don't want anybody to know you're a bum. There's this, there's this saving of face. There's this, there's this guilt and shame that's literally, quite literally, embedded inside of us from the founding of sin in the garden. And we are seeking all of our carnal human ways to overcompensate for it. And for Rocky, it meant just go the distance. I don't care if he busts my head open, I'm going to the, And if you've seen the first Rocky, that's about all he does. He just goes, he just takes a beating. Ain't no bum. About halfway through the fight, people are going, Rocky, Rocky, right? I mean, hey, at least I'm not a bum. Hey, that's what life seems to be about in the carnal mind. And Jesus comes, but he's coming to say, hey, listen, I never intended you to feel like you needed to overcompensate for being a bum because I created you in my image. And the only one that told you you were a bum is the wicked one. In fact, that's exactly what Jesus, or what God said to Adam and Eve in the garden. Who told you you were naked? Who told you you were a bum? I didn't think that. I didn't make you that way. Hey, teenage girl, who told you you weren't cool? Who told you you weren't lovable? Hey, teenage boy, who told you you weren't athletic enough? Who told you you weren't smart enough? Hey, hey, lady, who told you you weren't pretty? Who told you that you've gained too much weight? Jesus comes to the story and he says, hey, listen, I am not interested in the lies that you have adopted into the core of your being. I came to bring festival joy, not condemnation. That's the song we just sang about. Free from condemnation. Oh, praise the one. Hey, listen, Jesus came to set us to festival joy. He came to show us the art of celebration. Adam and Eve in Genesis, you know what the fig leaves were? Bum covering. (laughs) You won't forget that now. They were just afraid of being bums. They they come back and they've got fig leaves placed in strategic locations for one purpose. I don't want to be a bum. I don't want Jesus to see me as I really am, which is wicked and sinful and shameful and guilty. And where did all that come from? And that, isn't it funny? God didn't say, why are you naked? He said, who told you that? Who told you there was something wrong with the way I made you? Who told you that you could come up with a better remedy than what I created? Who, can I say it this way? Can I bring it into Bob vernacular? Who jacked this place up last night? I mean, who came in here and messed up my garden? Yesterday, we were walking in the cool of the morning. We were in festival joy together. And today, you're hiding and you're covering yourself. Who did this? Well, aren't you glad Jesus decided to come back 
and set it right? <laughs> have you ever, have you yet had this moment in your life? You can raise your hand if you want here. I'll, I'll raise mine. Have you had this moment where you said, I didn't know I was capable of that? A couple of us honest enough. <laughs> If you haven't had it, congratulations. Enjoy living in, in this fuzzy unicorn world you're in. But let me tell you something. You can do things you would never dream you would do. It's just true. There's a, there's a man by the name of Adolf Eichmann. Adolf was one of the architects of the Nazi Holocaust. He helped Adolf Hitler with the Holocaust and the killing of Jews. He escaped and hid in South America and was arrested in 1960 and taken back to Israel for war crimes and tried. The problem is what they had to do is they had to bring eyewitnesses forward to testify against him as material witnesses or he was going to get away with it. One of the eyewitnesses that they brought forward was Yehiel Denur. And this guy comes forward and, and he walks in and, and they had um, Adolf sitting in this uh, plastic box. If you've ever seen these, these uh, criminal trials, he was in a cage of plastic see-through glass. And, and uh, this, this man walks in, he's a material witness and he walks in and he collapses and starts bawling at the sight of the man. He composes himself, he testifies against him, and it goes on. Well, uh, later he was on 60 Minutes, and he was asked a question about that moment when he, when he hit the ground and was weeping. And the, the, the person that was giving the interview thought for sure, well, just no doubt you were succumbed with hatred for the man that had killed your family and it hurt you, and, and no doubt you were just so overwhelmed. And here's what he said, no doubt shocking the reporter with 60 Minutes, but here's what he said. He goes, no, 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 no. When I saw just a man in a box I realized he wasn't a demon he wasn't wicked he was just like me and I realized that I could also be that wicked wow is right see there's something that happens at some point in your life if you're going to get on the truth plane of things if you're going to get on the truth of, of what when you, when you see people doing wrong and you still look down on them and say things like, I just don't know how anybody could ever do that. You just haven't had your truth moment yet. This is why the church is really bad about guests coming in that clearly aren't performing well. And we kind of have this downward glance. It's not because the guest has a problem. It's because the church has a problem. And the church needs to wake up and understand that there is no sin that you aren't capable of. And it's a real wake up moment. You say, I thought you were talking about festival joy and now you're all up in my festival grill. Here's what I'm trying to say to you. Festival joy only means something when you realize how much was cleaned by that ceremonial pot for real. When you understand that the blood that saved you wasn't just a little bit because you were doing pretty good anyway. But when you realize that the blood that saved you was the same blood it would take to heal a Hitler or any other Adolf for that matter. And let me tell you something. That's when festival joy can kick in. You remember when the woman came to Jesus and she was washing his feet with her hair and she was weeping and she was crying and, and all the Christians were kind of like, what's she doing oh this could have been sold and given to the poor and Jesus says you leave her alone those that are forgiven much worship much in other words you just hadn't had your moment yet where you you realize you were forgiven of that much too because if you're guilty of one sin somebody say all you're guilty of all sins let's just let's just get off our homosexual hating high horse all you heteros in the room. Come on, you preacher. We don't talk about it in the South. We better start talking about it in the South because our kids are deciding it's something worth trying. Amen. And you know what I'd like them to know? I'd like them to know Jesus still loves them. And Jesus' blood can cleanse it from all unrighteousness. That's what my Bible says. I don't know who found a verse that, uh, that said there's one or two he can't, but they're wrong and it's not in the book. 
It preached real good up in the hills for a little while when nobody was there that was a homosexual. But let me tell you something. There's some that are going to walk into this church and I want them to fall into the glance of a loving Savior whose eyes don't condemn them but died to save them. That's the message of the church. And it's time for us to get off our high horses and our better than them attitudes. Let me tell you something. Do you know how the Nazis became the Nazis? They thought they were better than everyone else. Let me prove to you that what I'm teaching you is right. If you think you're doing better than someone else, you're just like Adolf. That's why the Holocaust took place. They didn't have the right color hair. They didn't have the right color uh, of eyes. They were, they were mongoloids. They were, they, were, they were problem people. And so what we're going to do is we're just going to treat them like they don't exist. And that's exactly what the church is doing to sinners. We are as guilty as the man in the plastic box and it's time for us to fall on our face and weep and cry because of the haughty high-mindedness that we have. I need those wash pots and so do you. Oh, that Jesus would cleanse me and make me clean and the good news is he did and he will. I wanna talk to you about weddings. I've got just a minute or two but we're, we're gonna go a little bit long. Be patient. Lunch is going to taste better if you'll hang with me for a second. All right. How does Jesus bring healing to what is spiritually wrong with us? How does he do it? Jesus says to his mother, woman, what have I to do with thee? Then he says these words, mine hour has not yet come. What hour is it talking about? Let me tell you, it's not the sweet hour of prayer. That's a hymn. When you study the Bible and Jesus talks about the hour it's the hour of his death. You say, what was Jesus thinking about at the wedding? Well, this is a real good time. This is a part of the message I'm so excited to get to because I want you to hear what Kristen had to say about you ladies. But uh, I have a problem. I'm a man. I thought some of you would jump on that. But okay. Um, I, I think like a man. And so I went to a lot of weddings. I was in 20 weddings as a best man. That's a little much. It was a little much. Our first home went to tuxedo rentals and long distance phone calls to my girlfriend. And, uh, but we, I, I, I was in 20 weddings as a, a best man or one of the groomsmen. And I, I was at a lot of weddings. And I've, I've, I've had, and let me tell you what goes on when you're on the, the groomsman part of the party. It's not much of a party. <laughs> the girls are getting their hair done and, and they feel like the guys should be there. Uh, for this whole process. So the guys, they usually let us come two or three hours later, but then they stick us in a room. We can get ready in 10 minutes. They got us there for three hours early to get our picture. Anybody else tracking with me? And so you're sitting in that room with a bunch of dudes. You're pretty sure you're not being heard because they're in the other room is all kinds of stuff coming out of the other room, okay? So you're pretty sure you can't be heard. So in this, in this honest place of, of maleness, here's what the conversation is like. Dude, you sure, man? I mean, really, it's over. I don't know what you're thinking, man. I mean, we're going to do some fun things next year, and it's over, man. And then this guy lies to himself. He's like, no, guys, I mean, it's cool. You can come on over to the house. <laughs> no, you're bringing one of them in, man. And when they come in, it all changes. You're probably not going to have an Xbox this time next year. You're going to have like a signs on the house that say things that are cute <laughs> and you're going to have plants in the yard that are there just to look at and not eat and uh, it's going to change bro that's how boys at weddings think now hang with me I know the gender blender has messed everything up and now there's some boys that are like I'm getting married <laughs> that ain't normal it's all messed up now, okay? But just hang with me. We're talking about an ancient wedding feast. And it was, back in the day, it was kind of like, I don't know, man. I mean, here's what was going through my mind. Is there a girl alive that's worth giving up everything for? <laughs> Girls, I'm told, think about it differently. Now, I've got a little six-year-old, and I watched her at a couple weddings. And I'm telling you, her mind is not where mine was as a boy. She's looking at things. She's just, you can see it. I took her to Disney and we were, we were, I took her to a daddy daughter princess date at Disney and we were walking in and this, this carriage came by, this glass carriage with these little miniature horses and this lady in a wedding gown went by. I got a picture of it, Jordan standing there. She was probably four and you can't see her face but literally her back looks like this. <laughs> now let me tell you what this emoji is. I want that. 
that's my carriage. Those are my little horses, and this is about me one day. And she looked up at me, and she had this look that just freaked me out. I was still in some pain over the admission price of Disney. Her look was like, you will buy this for me. I was freaking, man. I'd be honest, like, let's go. We're going to go eat. And don't look at the horses and don't look at the glass carriage and don't look at that beautiful bride. I don't know if she was pretty or not, but Disney made her pretty. And they can do that. They're like the devil. They can make anything look good. And uh, that's kind of where it's at. I, have, I told you I was in 20 weddings. I've done about 30 weddings since I became pastor of this church or, or as a youth pastor. And I, I've stood right here. And I'm going to tell you a couple things that always happen. Those back doors open and I, I always look at the groom. How many of you do this? You look at the groom. Where is, how many of you have ever seen the groom like, he's like, oh man. <laughs> and you'll see, if he's got a good best man, you'll see this. <laughs> now you might not notice it, but I stand here and I'm telling you, I'm, I, I'm, I'm, they love you ladies, but let me tell you, the guys are like, I just gave up everything. Now the girl comes in the back door and she's like, they usually don't even see the groom till about the fourth row. And it's like, oh yeah, oh, he's here. I mean, it's just, it's their day, man. Now listen, ladies, I, I asked Kristen, what is going on in the mind of the bride? She does all of our wedding coordination here at the church. And she told me on good authority as a woman, she said, oh, it's about them. It's their day. She goes, there's only one exception to that rule. I was very interested. Because from up here, I've never seen the exception to that rule. She said, sometimes there's a mother that thinks it's her day. And I was like, oh, I'm saying that because you're going to be in trouble. And, and listen, the only thing that could trump the bride is the mother of the bride. And if it was you, smile so we know it wasn't you. <laughs> hey, listen, there's something different going on in the mindset. What was Jesus thinking? Well, number one, he was a boy. By the way, what do single people think about at weddings? You ever see a single person sitting at a wedding with a far off look in their eye? What are they thinking about? One day. And it's either, it's either this or it's. <laughs> and usually that matches their gender. If it's a girl, it's like, unless she's like 40, then it's kind of like, yeah, it's just, it's the way it goes. And uh, so there, I'm getting everybody mad at me, but in a minute we're going to pray and everybody has to be right for lunch, okay? So here's what's going on. The, Jesus was at a wedding. He's a single man. He's actually thinking about his wedding. Yeah. I don't know if you understand this, but he is the groom and we are the bride. He has gone to prepare a place for us. He... He's thinking about his wedding like all single people do at a wedding feast. And Mary walks up and he says, they're out of wine. And you could see him go, really? My hour isn't come yet. I've already got to worry about the bride. I've already got to start tasting of this bitter cup. Let me tell you what a, a great author said about this moment. I'm going to read it to you so I get it right. It's a beautiful quote. Jesus, Edmund Clowney said this, Jesus sat amidst all the joy of the wedding feast, sipping the coming sorrow. So we can sit amidst all the world's sorrow, sipping the coming joy. Don't miss this. I'm gonna give you two practical points and we'll get out of here. The first one is this. Every time God chooses a metaphor to help us see him better, it also shows us how he sees us. The metaphor of God being the, the groom and us being the bride shows in the metaphor. If you're a man in the room, you know what I'm talking about. I already told you what happens behind the scenes on the wedding day. When a guy is standing there looking at those back doors, he's already said, shh, I'm doing this. He's already said, You can have it. He's already said, I will work the rest of my life. I will give her everything I can get my hands on. 
I have found the one girl on the planet that is worth me setting down everything. By the way, if you don't have that attitude, don't you ask for my daughter's hand in marriage. Not interested. He's at this place. This is the, this is the picture Jesus said. I want you to explain how I feel about you. He left heaven's splendor. He told heaven to, shh, I'll go. So he stands there with his eyes fixed on you. This is how much God loves you. I will pay everything. Just say yes. Be my bride. Let me be your God. Let me meet your needs. Let me let my blood cover your sin gaffes. Let me let me take care of it all. Be my bride. Yes, it is about you, but because it brings glory to me, I will give everything for you. This sign was shown to us that God might begin to glorify himself. It is a beautiful, beautiful picture. And if you're missing it, here's what I want you to understand. Do you have any idea what the bride looks like to the groom? I know this world's messed up and some guys get to this place, have no clue what they're doing. But let me tell you something. There's some that get it. And when they get it, it is an accurate picture of what God sees in you. Let me give you the second practical thought and we'll get out of here. You need to deal with the present by looking to the future. That's what Jesus was actually doing in this moment. In the moment of this story, Jesus is at this wedding feast and he is looking at the future. And for Jesus, the future held some sorrow in it. In fact, later he would call that hour the bitter cup. If there's any way this cup could pass from me, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And he drinks the bitter cup. Jesus is looking to the future. That is what I want you to do. But understand, we don't have a bitter cup to drink. Jesus is the groom. We're the bride. And man, I'm telling you, we live in a world that's got so much pain and sorrow. We've got, we've got so many things that don't go right. And, and, and here Jesus is sitting at this wedding feast. And it's, oh no, we've got a problem. And, and sure enough, ring Jesus up. How many of you got Jesus on speed dial? And we ring Jesus up all the time, but we ring Jesus up and we don't realize sometimes what it cost him for our yes. What it took for him as he took that bitter sorrow of the cross to give us festival joy. Jesus is saying this in this first of all miracles. He comes and he says, look, let me tell you, my hour is not yet come. But you know what, if we're gonna make a sign of this, let's, let's make a good sign. Now, there they are. Get those ceremonial pots of washing because I'm coming to do away with the ceremony. I'm the real thing. I am the real thing. I will clean you. I will make you whole again. And enough of the ceremonies. As the groom stands up here on the ceremonial, boy, I wish couples would prepare more for the marriage than the wedding. I'm so glad it's not called the wedding supper of the lamb. It's the marriage supper of the lamb. Because Jesus understands that for all eternity, it is going to be we and he. And it's going to be us. And he is the glory of everything. And we will stand there and we will sing for all of eternity the praises of our groom, of our matchless Savior, of our Redeemer. And man, one thing's going to get straight. Maybe it won't be until about the fourth row of heaven. But there's going to be something straight. When we get there, all of a sudden our eyes are going to lock on his. And we're going to go, oh. That's the big answer to all of life's questions. I believe this. I believe that when we get to heaven, I don't know how it will manifest itself. But somewhere around that fourth pew, (laughs) when we lock eyes with Jesus, in that moment, something is going to happen that is so magnificent, that is such festival joy, that every pain we've ever known will be washed away. Every hurt, every sore, every, every sin, everything that still plagues us, even though we know he forgave us, that gaff that was such an embarrassment. In that moment, the Bible says Jesus will wipe every tear away. Something's going to happen that there's so much festival joy that it will have all been worth it. What is this life all about? Well, it's become a mess, but I'll tell you what, what Jesus is all about, setting it right again. Can we pray? We got to get out of here. Let's pray. Father, Lord, we love you.
Lord, I I pray that you would just help our church to understand as we look at this wedding feast and we look about the, the, the joy that's set before us was sorrow set before you. You were going to give us all joy by losing all of yours. You were going to give us everything by quite literally becoming nothing. Broken, spilled out, poured out, dying on a tree for your bride. Church, as your pastor, this would be a real good time, just in the stillness of your heart, to look at your groom and say, thank you. Thank you. Jesus, thank you for the cost that you paid. Would you look up here at me, church? Can I tell you something about forgiveness? If you're in any relationship, there has to be forgiveness. Something about forgiveness. If, if Ivan comes over to my house and, and Ivan knocks a lamp over and breaks it, I have one of two choices. I can say, hey, $49.99. <laughs> or I can say, man, it's no big deal. It's, it's just a lamp. But hear me. I have to live without a lamp. Or I have to go buy another lamp. Forgiveness is not about acting like it never happened. Forgiveness is saying, I'll take the pay. I'll take the cost. Yeah, it hurts. But I'll do that. You're more valuable than a lamp. You're more valuable than a hurt. You're more valuable than the cost. That's forgiveness. Jesus looks at his bride and he's like, I got you covered. I'll pay that. Somewhere after all that sinks in, look out, festival joy. You'll get it.